then on to the, the session itself, right? So I'd like to introduce Peter Stone. We're very happy to have him. He's a, a professor at University of Texas at Austin. And also, as he writes on his slide here, executive director of uh, Sony AI, Sony AI America. Um, and then um, he is one of the, the fathers of uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning, having written one of the early surveys in the field and done a lot of the uh, seminal work in the area um, on a number of different topics, um, as well as many important applications of multi-agent reinforcement learning and multi-agent systems, such as uh, his famous work with RoboCup and Robot Soccer, as well as uh, traffic management and other cool applications like that. Um, he's also, um, I guess it means that you're both old, getting older and successful and that you have a bunch of students now that are making huge contributions in the field as well, right? So, so that are all well known in their own right as well. Uh, and he, Peter has won numerous awards. I don't have time to list all of them, but uh, a number of best papers, uh, as well as he's a fellow of uh, AAAI, IEEE, ACM, and a bunch of other societies as well. He's won the IJCAI Computers and Thought Award, the ACM uh, SIG AI Autonomous Agents Award, as well as a bunch of other uh, awards. Uh, and today he's gonna talk to us about topics in multi-agent learning motivated by ad hoc teamwork, which is one of the many uh, fields within uh, multi-agent uh, learning that he's created. So go ahead and take it away, Peter. Great, thank you very much, Chris. And thanks, uh, thanks for the very kind introduction and uh, to all the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this, this seminar series, which I think is a fantastic idea and a great service to the community. Thanks for doing it. And um, you know, I, I really enjoyed uh, hearing the talks of, of my, my good friends, Mike Bowling and Craig Boudelier before me. Um, and there's some fantastic speakers coming up. So thank, thank you all of you, uh, all of you for, for including me and for, for organizing this. Um, so this talk is uh, gonna be a little bit different than, than talks I've given on ad hoc teamwork recently. So I, I sort of asked the organizers, well, I have a prepared talk that I gave as a plenary at IJCAI a few weeks ago that gives an overview, sort of a broad high level overview of ad hoc teamwork. Um, which I could just give and it would be sort of polished and, and you know, sort of smooth, or I could, you know, sort of jump around between a few slide decks and maybe do some more deeper technical dives into, into some, um, some work on multi-agent reinforcement learning, which is, and I think, um, you know, they rightly suggested that for this audience, um, doing that sort of deeper technical dive would be worthwhile. And so uh, I thought a lot about what I would present and I'll, um, what I'm gonna do is, is um, sort of give an overview of ad hoc teamwork just briefly, which is borrowed from some of these, some slides from this, this talk I gave it um, at Ichikai and some other uh, places recently, but then truncate that and, and dive into to, um, one older piece of work that I'd really like this community to, community to be aware of. Um, and then two, you know, if there's time permitting, and I, I don't know how long it'll take to, to go through all of this, and I, uh, um, and I don't know, uh, you know how many questions there will be, um, but I do invite people to to interrupt and and ask questions. It's fine if I don't get through everything. So I you know I may jump into some some more recent stuff at the at the end. So um, so just to lead off, um, I just I am here at, at, at UT Austin, um, and uh, there's some really exciting things going on here. So I just want to take the opportunity to let people know we have we do have a a new institute for foundations of machine learning. Um, that has led to the formation of a machine learning laboratory. I'm the director of Texas Robotics, and we just have a new, we just had a new uh, beautiful space opened up for us in, in an old historic gymnasium that's been renovated for robotics. And so, if you know, I really do hope that many of you will be able to come and visit here and, and see some of the great things um, going on. But as I was discussing with uh, you know with the organizers bef um, before this ta uh, talk started or the call started, there's also been. Uh, some recent crazy times um, here in Austin. You may know that uh, that there was a big uh, ice storm, which Austin is not really equipped for, um, and uh, power outages. And um, what one of the things that came into the you know, public um, awareness was our electricity market, which is it's actually a big multi-agent system. Um, it's been the inspiration for PowerTech, uh, the trading agent competition in, in electricity markets, and it's also. Um, the inspiration for um, a, a benchmark for multi-agent reinforcement learning, and I promised my colleagues Zoltan Nagy that I would um, that I would uh, make all of you here aware of it because I think it, it's something that you all um, may find useful, which is um, an environment called CityLearn, 
um, the gym environment that, that deals with energy storage control um, with centralized and decentralized RL agents with the goal of trying to optimize um, an electricity market. There's been um, a, uh, a City Learn challenge in 2020 There'll be a, that was held um, at, a, at a workshop that's with the link here, and there'll also be an event in, in 2021. And so I think this people here may, may really find this, this interesting as a, as a testbed domain for multi-agent reinforcement learning. It's really well done, and I encourage, uh, encourage you to check it out. Um, so for those of you who don't already know me, I'd like to, I do like in every talk to give sort of a one slide introduction to, to myself and my, in my research. Um, I do the, the research question that really ties all the various things I do together is to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and our adversaries in real time dynamic domains. And of course, you know, that touches on a bunch of different sub areas of, um, of AI. I do a lot of work that's reinforcement learning, but not multi-agent systems. A lot of work that, that's multi-agent systems, but not reinforcement learning. In this talk, I'm gonna really dive into the intersection of those two, my multi-agent reinforcement learning um, work. We do both sort of foundational bottom-up, you know, algorithmic work, which I will talk about today, and more application-oriented um, work. So, you know, for instance, um, you know, some of the application domains that I've worked in are, are uh, RoboCup, Robot Soccer, um, the Robot Soccer World Cup. This is a video from a long, oops, I didn't mean to do that, um, from um, 15 uh, years ago or so. Um, this is from uh, a little more recently, um, the uh, the humanoid robots in the in the RoboCup League. This is the, the Aldebaran robots. We won this competition a few years ago. Um, I'm now the president of the RoboCup Federation, and it's also a fantastic domain for, for work on multi-agent uh, multi systems and, um, and machine learning. Um, I'm also inspired a lot by trying to create general purpose service robots. So if you do come to my uh, lab, you'll see robots like this one, just sort of wandering around in the hallways, trying to um, interact with people, trying to uh, interact with each other. We do, we, with multi, we have more than one of these robots wandering in the hallways. Again, another great inspiring domain for multi-agent systems. Um, and I did have a car in the DARPA urban challenge um, and have uh, thought about a lot about what will it, take to get uh, cars through um, intersections once all the cars on the road are autonomous. I know these videos aren't streaming super smoothly, but, but um, this is some you know, so, sort of also a multi-agent systems approach um, to autonomous driving. And each of those application domains I could talk about for you know, a full talk, but they're the kinds of, of problems that inspire me is, is how do we coordinate um, teammates and adversaries in these real-time dynamic domains. For this talk, I'm gonna zero in on, um, on teamwork uh, without so um, you know without thinking about adversaries but rather thinking about uh, cooperative multi-agent systems and you know people are very uh, very adept at, at teamwork people you know rescue crews will practice together and work together to, to you know execute complex missions um, I did mention robot oops, robot soccer as a um, as a test bed domain um, and just you know in, in robotics in general but usually in these in cooperative in teamwork settings, we we do pre coordination. We assume that the team of agents are given protocols. They can train together. Um, some of my first research in in, um, in multi agent systems introduced um, sort of the ability to do to have like what we call the locker room agreement in periodic team synchronization domains, where the robots were given their coordination languages and protocols. Um, some research with with uh, Rich Sutton. Um, back in, in 2001 was in the robot soccer keep away domain where we had these red agents learn together to keep the ball away from the blue agents um, using uh, you know, a form of multi-agent reinforcement learning. But again, they trained the whole time together and they got good at cooperating and, and acting as a team because they, they trained as a team. The problem of ad hoc teamwork, which uh, it is um, sort of, um, breaks that assumption and, and takes the perspective that an ad hoc team player is an individual and the, the teammates um, are unknown or they're, they're programmed by others. You don't get to practice with them. Um, you might not be able to communicate with them, although you might, um, and they're likely to be suboptimal. If they are, you, the approach can't be, let's make my teammates better. The approach has to be, what can I do to deal with the suboptimality of my, of my teammates? And people can do this. I can go play in a pickup soccer game in 
um, you know, in a different country with people I've never seen before. Um, if I speak the same language of the, as them, then we might, you know, immediately start talking about what position I'll play. But even if I don't speak the same language, we can just jump in and start, you know, working as a team. And we'd like to be able to make that possible for robots. If there's like a disaster rescue scenario and I bring a robot and Chris brings a robot and a whole bunch of other people bring robots, um, we want them to be able to just immediately work together and we don't, without us having to reprogram them. And so the challenge of ad hoc teamwork is trying to create a good team player. And so it introduced in, it, as a AAAI official challenge, there was, there was a challenge track at the AAAI 2010 conference um, where we framed the, the problem as creating an autonomous agent that's able to efficiently and robustly collaborate with previously unknown teammates on tasks to which they are all individually capable of contributing as team members. So the assumption is we know how to do the task. I've practiced with other teammates. I've just never seen these teammates before. And they're also, you know, have done that. So there's a whole bunch of interesting technical requirements, um, many of which can, uh, you know, sort of uh, are, uh, have learning approaches and so become multi-agent reinforcement learning problems. But trying to assess the capabilities of other teammates, um, assessing the other teammates, the other agents' knowledge states, what they, you know, what they currently believe, um, assessing their current objectives, which is plan recognition. And then estimating the effects of my actions or you know, my agent's actions on the, on the teammates. And, um, and so all of these are sort of you know, learning problems, but learning where there's a big pressure on low sample complexity, because you need to be able to, um, to you know, right out of the box with very little uh, experience, adapt to your new team. And you need to be able to inter be prepared to interact with many types of teammates. Um, that may be able, you know, may have communication, may be more or less mobile, may be better or worse at, um, at sensing. And so a good team player's best actions will differ depending on its teammates' characteristics. And that's sort of, you know, one of the things you need to accept when working on ad hoc teamwork. So that's all by way of introduction. Um, at this point, you know, you can go to my website if you want to see a talk that sort of continues to give an overview of, um, of ad hoc teamwork and some of the, you know, sort of uh, a, a survey of some of the approaches we've used over the, over the years, um, including uh, Sam Barrett's the thesis, Katie Genter's thesis, and other, other work in my, in my lab, and from uh, other places around the, around the world. Um, Stefano Albrecht, who's at, at University of Edinburgh, has played a big role in this. And there's been many, many conferences, workshops, or I guess workshops and symposia on ad hoc teamwork. Um, that I, this sort of survey in that talk, if you go to my website, there, there's a link to the IJKAI plenary and, um, and a recent talk in the um, pair workshop at, at AAAI. But instead today, I'm going to um, go into um, a few different topics in, in multi-agent reinforcement learning that I think this audience is particularly um, you know, equipped to understand and appreciate, and that I really do, you know, would, would like to have uh, to make sure are, are better known. And in particular, I'm going to start, and this will, this may be the bulk of the time, going into talking about some some fantastic work by a former student of mine, Doran Chakraborty, um, from about 10 years ago now. Um, on uh, oops, I, there's a typo here. It says convergence, targeted optimality, and safety in multi-agent um, learning. And uh, originally published in ICML 2010, a journal article, the comprehensive journal article in, in JAMAS in 2013. And, um, and it is sort of, you know, uh, it's, it's, um, get, gets, it's, a, it's theoretical work. Um, and it's, uh, it's I think, uh, not as well known as it, as it um, should be, partly because Doran went on to, uh, to industry afterwards, so didn't, uh, didn't continue working on it. But really, it, you know, as I've gone back and, and reminded myself of all the details, it really you know, does stand the test of time and is something that I, that I really um, would love to hear reactions from this community on. So I'm going to take as much time as it, it is required to do that. And I'm going to jump to the slide deck that Doran actually created um, for uh, the ICML presentation and, and walk through that. And then time permitting, I'll, I'll uh, jump to, um, to some work from IJKAI and, uh, and AMOS coming up um, on balancing individual preferences and shared objectives in multi-agent learning, and also um, multi-agent learning for reducing traffic congestion. Um, and again, so this is where I'm gonna be jumping from slide deck to slide deck. So uh, apologies for the um, lack of, of consistent styles. Um, and again, do uh, if, if there are questions, feel free to interrupt now or at any time as we go. Um, 
And each of these, by the way, does is multi-agent learning for, for ad hoc teamwork in one way or another. So, so jumping right in. So um, this is the convergence uh, here, it's spelled correctly, targeted optimality and safety in multi-agent learning. And um, this does take the game, uh, the, a game theoretic perspective on multi-agent learning where we have um, agents involved in a repeated matrix game with N players and, uh, and N actions. And on each time step, each agent just sees the joint action and hence the payoffs of, of every, every other agent. So um, the question is, is there any way for an agent, an individual agent to ensure that the payoffs, um, uh, ensure certain payoffs against unknown opponents? Um, and so it is gonna be a multi-agent learning, the opponents aren't known. And this, what everything I'm going to talk about here is actually going to, you know, it's going to start from this perspective of opponents, but it also applies to unknown teammates. And we did extend it in that direction as well, as I'll mention um, at the end. And so it is, you know, it is very, very applicable to and uh, to ad hoc teamwork um, as well. But let's just for simplicity, let's assume that that we are we are an agent and we have opponents that we're trying to interact with, and. The high level contribution here is that it's the first, what we developed and, and Doran led on was, was the first multi-agent learning algorithm, which we call seamless for convergence with model learning and safety that has three separate properties. Um, so in an N player N action repeated game, it converges to a Nash equilibrium with probability one in self play. So if the other agent is also a seamless agent, it will find a Nash equilibrium against a set of memory bounded counterparts um, of memory size with a bounded memory size. And by memory bounded, I mean that they, the behavior that they take um, is determined by some history with, with bounded memory of the past actions that the agents have taken. So for instance, um, a tit for tat agent in Prisoner's Dilemma is, um, has memory size one. And it, it you know, decides what to do based on my last action. But in principle, it could make a decision based on my last five actions or my last eight actions. As long as the memory size it uses to make its decision um, is less than Kmax, which is a, a parameter that, that we give, um, then uh, Seamless will converge to playing uh, close to the best response with a very high probability. So in a, in a pack sense, an epsilon delta proof will, is, is what will happen here. Um, and that's called targeted optimality. In other words, it, it achieves optimality against a targeted set of, um, of opponents where the targeted set here are all opponents that have a memory, that, that act in a memory bounded way um, with size, uh, with bound at most Kmax. Um, it also holds for opponents that, that uh, eventually become memory bounded um, and it can do this in, in polynomial time. And then, okay, so that tells you what Seamless does against in self-play and against targeted uh, opponents. It also has the property that against every unknown agent that is neither a Seamless agent nor part of this targeted set, that it will um, ensure the, uh, the maximum payoff, the safety value. So the value, you know, the, the play that I should do if I wanna make sure that I, that I, I can't be exploited. So Can I quickly interrupt, to... Peter? Yes, I think please. there is a question in the in the Good. chat box. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, no. But otherwise, I can I can read it out. So uh, Yong Zhao is asking: Is a setting n player zero sum or general sum? So it can be general sum. So um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's general sum, and uh, it we, it might be simpler to think about it in terms of zero sum. The example I'm going to give here for in the next slides are, are zero sum, but but I. Uh, but yeah, this, and then this does apply to the team, to all the way to, to fully cooperative. We could do this against, uh, you know, against uh, memory bounded teammates as well, where it's a where it's a fully cooperative setting. So yeah, full, think of this as fully general sum. Is uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, Good. So here's the high level overview of seamless and it is, you know, to achieve this, it actually, you know, we, there, there's a lot, there's a lot of steps to making this happen and, uh, and a lot of sort of technical details to, to make the proof go through of being able to do this um, uh, in, in, um, in polynomial time. And again, the full details are in the, um, in the JAMAS article, but, but the high level, and I'm going to walk, walk through each of these steps is it starts by trying to coordinate to a Nash equilibrium assuming all the other agents are seamless agents. 
Um, and so it basically goes through a testing phase to see if, if they are, and then um, and sort of you know, assumes that they are. And if there's no evidence that they're not, then it'll just keep playing that Nash equilibrium. Um, and, and then you get convergence. If it gets finds evidence that the other agents are not seamless agents, then it drops down to the right here and goes and plays an algorithm that we that we call um, MLES for model learning with safety, um, where it first tries to model the opponents as memory bounded with it max, with a memory of at most k max. Um, if it if there's evidence that they are, then it can uh, then it will use a um, use essentially the RMAX algorithm um, to to uh, to find the optimal policy against that um, that agent. And if it gets evidence that they're not memory bounded, then it will revert to its safety policy. And it does, and it goes to the safety policy often enough that it all that it can guarantee that with that the um, that it'll re, re, um, give a value that's within epsilon of, of the safety value, the minimax, the maximum value. So, um, you know, so the motivating example is this is the the you know the familiar game of Battle of the Sexes or Bach Stravinsky. Um, here, there's multiple Nash equilibria, two in pure, in pure strategies, um, one in mixed strategies, where each player goes to its preferred event two thirds of the time. So, you know, we could assume that that we're Alice and Bob is the opponent. Um, Alice will, by using seamless, will start by assuming that Bob is also a seamless agent. Um, we'll use a Nash equilibrium solver to compute a Nash strategy for both Alice and Bob. Now, Bob will also do the same and might come up with a different Nash equilibrium, and that's okay. Um, but because uh, there'll be multiple loops through here to try to to eventually converge to the same to to randomly hit on the same Nash equilibrium. But it then um, picks a a value a, a number of times to to play as if you were in this Nash equilibrium, and again the the values here. Um, are carefully chosen to 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 make sure that that all of the you know the, the convergent the um, polynomial time properties and the and, and the probabilities guarantees follow through. But let's assume that that you decided to play um, the uh, the equilibrium strategy for a hundred time steps. Um, then um, you play your own part of the Nash strategy for that number of episodes, and and then um, if any of the agent, any of the other agents out there, it's easier to think of this with two agents, but in general, it could be multiple agents. If any of them deviated by some amount um, from its Nash strategy, so for instance, um, if you know you were playing, uh, assuming that it would be the two thirds, one third um, equilibrium, and Alice played um, one of the actions thirty one percent of the time, and Bob played 60, 65 um, at, at sixty five percent of the time, either that's within tolerance of your Nash equilibrium. Um, in which case you just continue, or if it's not within tolerance, then you go into a signaling phase. And by the way, this this algorithm, this part of the algorithm is very uh, resembles, you know, is is, is um, very closely patterned off of, of Vince Conitzer and Thomas Sandholm's article uh, algorithm called Awesome. Um, but uh, but just this part of it. So it goes into a signaling phase, where you play according, where each agent. They'll recognize every agent will recognize that you that the Nash equilibrium wasn't um, wasn't uh, followed if they are seamless agents, and then um, the first time you get into the signaling signaling phase, every seamless agent should play um, action A one k max plus one times, and then go back and assume that your uh, you know and and assume that your um, you know uh, the Nash equilibrium. You're, you're all seamless agents and continuing and continue to um, to try a different Nash equilibrium. If one of the agents doesn't do that, then you know that it's not a seamless agent, and you can break out of this whole signaling routine and go to um, to uh, the the MLES part of the algorithm. Um, but if all of the agents do do that that sort of fixed action. Uh, Kmax plus one times, then you assume you continue assuming that they're Cmax uh, that they're seamless agents, and you continue trying to find a Nash equilibrium match. The second time you get here, there's just a small change. You have to play that same action Kmax times, but some different action once or different random action once, and then after that, you'll always play um, a, a one uh, Kmax plus one times. The reason for this is that no memory bounded agent with memory bound of Kmax could do this. 
um, deterministically. So you're either uh, at this point, you're, if you're if you keep following this pattern, you're a seamless agent or you're not a memory bounded agent. Um, and so you're able to you know sort of if if ever an one of the agents doesn't do this, then you know that you can drop out of of this part. So that's the that's again it's patterned very much of, out of after uh, the the awesome algorithm. We we have another question, Peter. Okay, go um, ahead. maybe uh, Stefan, do you do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. If you guys can hear me, thanks. Yep. So um, you you assume that you already start out by playing uh, a Nash equilibrium when you assume the other ones to be also seamless agents. Um, is this assumed to be available in constant time, or otherwise, how do you square polynomial runtime with um, using Nash equilibria with which are p pad complete? Yeah. Okay. So so this is this is um, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. So we have to we have to have a Nash equilibrium solver for um, for the game that we're playing that that we can um, that that, uh, that they're all uh, that they're all using. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I think I think we have so this will will not um, will not generalize to the to the case where we we can't can't find the um, the Nash the Nash equilibrium in 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 time. Um, okay, yeah. so the the point is mostly to to coordinate on a Nash rather than finding it in the first place. That's right. Okay, that's right. Okay, this is, this is that, you, that you that you know what the set of the Nash equilibrium equilibria are for the game. Um, so it's not it's uh, that's right. So, so, but, but this is just to find, to choose among the ones, then make sure you coordinate on it. It's a good point. Thanks for raising that. All right. Thank you. Good. So, um, so then once you, so, you know, the, the algorithm's over, if they all are seamless agents, they will find each other and, and just, and play the, you know, the Nash equilibrium against a set of memory bounded counterparts. Um, if, if not, they will have dropped into this, uh, to the next part. Um, and so now they're trying to find, uh, um, they're going to converge to the the uh, to targeted optimality, and so I'll show how that happens. So, um, so how do you play against memory bounded opponents? Um, so, the the a key insight here is that that memory bounded opponents can be modeled playing against a memory bounded opponent can be modeled as a Markov decision. Behavior of the adversary induces the MVP. So we, we call this an adversary induced MDP. So basically at every state where the state is, is determined by the history of past actions, the opponent has some probability of taking um, taking what any any action, that's the transition probabilities. And when it takes that action with your action, you get a you get a reward, that's the reward function. So you can derive a reward function as a transition function if you know the model of the um, of the opponent, what what their memory bounded policy is. Um, and so uh, the problem here, the challenge here is that both K, what their memory bound is, and what their strategy is are unknown. And so those have to be figured out. And so, you know, just as an example of an adversary induced MVP, um, if we were playing this, this battle of the sexes with Bach, Bach and Stravinsky, um, if, you know, say the past two actions were that we both played B and then we both played S at time T, if Alice plays S, um, then that's going to transition us to a state where the most recent action becomes the second most recent action. Alice definitely played S, and now Bob's action determines which of two possible states we end up next, and those will also come with them a, a, a reward. So we'll either transition to this state or we'll transition to this state with one of these rewards. It basically, and then you just continue. So it becomes um, an MVP. And so, um, the optimal policy is is the opt for this adversary induced Markov decision process is the optimal way of playing against Bob. So the question is, how do we find um, how do we find this? Uh, you know, how do we do that? That's that's what the MLES algorithm is for, um, and it works as follows. It basically this is the high level. It starts at a um, it it computes the best estimate of k using an algorithm that we introduced called find k, creatively named. Um, and uh, and then, if it has essentially, if it has found evidence that the agent is a, um, a memory bounded agent with with bound K, then it will basically run the RMAX algorithm, which has which has a mistake bound 
um, you know, a polynomial number of, of suboptimal actions guarantee. Um, to explore, it uses optimism in the face of uncertainty to, to try to get to states um, that it hasn't done sufficiently to build a model of what the opponent will do in any of those you know, history states and find the, um, the optimal policy um, against this, this opponent. Um, if it doesn't find, if it can't find a good um, K with, that, that would indicate that the agent is a, is a memory bounded opponent with, with bound K, then it'll play the safety strategy sufficient, a sufficient number of times to get it within epsilon of the safety value, and then it can go through this process again. And so, um, so that's sort of, you know, we'll to keep it within epsilon of, of safety. So the, a key here is the find K algorithm, which I, which I mentioned, and I'll give the intuition for this. It basically looks at the amount of predictive power you get by modeling the opponent as a, um, having a memory bound of one, two, three, all the way up to K max, uh, K max plus one. So for example, if the, your opponent is playing tit for tat, then if you model it as having a memory of zero, you're not gonna be able to predict what actions it takes next. Cause you know, sometime it'll, it'll defect, sometime it will cooperate. Um, it will be basing that on what you did last, but you, with a memory bound of zero, you won't have that in your state space. If you move to a memory bound of one, all of a sudden you can perfectly predict what your agent is, what the other agent is going to do. Um, and if you move to a memory size of two, you can also perfectly predict, um, but it'll take more data. And so you, and, and you don't get any more predictive power for doing that. So basically, you know, you're going to step down at, at the, the, um, the, the possible memory sizes and and see at what point what memory size do i do i stop getting more information if i model my age my, my opponent is having a, a larger memory size um and so uh, the the details of how to compute these values are in in the in the paper but you're basically you know creating a maximum likelihood model um of, of um you know, what's your, how, how often can you, uh, or within what tolerance can you predict the, the next behavior of your opponent based on the history of what it's done, um, given that, that state history. And then there's some, um, some sort of values that we require um, for theoretical purposes to, to make sure that, um, that we can again do this um, efficiently. A key, um, a key step here Thanks. is that- so I think that's what my, my, my superpower is. Uh, is that a question? No, somebody just needs to be muted. Um, okay, so uh, it, um, a, a key here is that it does need to periodically explore um, picking a uh, a larger model because if it you know it, it may get stuck thinking that the opponent is memory bounded one and never test the hypothesis that it's uh, memory bounded you know it has a larger memory bound and so it every um, it periodically does have to. Um, use an Rmax instance with a larger memory bound. And again, it does this sufficiently off, often to make sure that it will find um, the right K. Um, the theoretical properties are, are here summarized on the, on the slide. And again, in the talk, it's hard to go through them um, in detail, but it, it, only, um, it needs only a polynomial number of visits to every feasible joint history of size K to find the true opponent memory size um, uh, with probability at least one minus delta. Um, it is polynomial in one over delta and k-max, and the overall time complexity of computing the uh, an epsilon best response, um, meaning a, you know a best response that gives you a value within epsilon of the best response you could have gotten, um, against a memory bound a, a opponent is then polynomial in the size of of, of sort of a, a bunch of quantities here, and um, for opponents which which can't be modeled as k-max memory bounded it'll converge to the safety, safety strategy with probability one in the limit. Um, so that's really the, that's really the algorithm. It's, and, and the, the, um, the details are, you know, if you're interested in this, I think if, if there's any audience that can appreciate the details in, uh, of this algorithm and that, that I think could be inspired of it, this is the one. So I, I haven't actually given a talk um, about this. Uh, I think Doran gave the, the conference talks in the past, but, um, and it's been, you know, many years, but I, but I really do think this, you know, this remains um, uh, an interesting and valuable algorithm, and I hope it'll inspire people um, to, you know, to push it further. Um, we had, we actually did. Um, this is the the initial version of it. I'll tell you about some of our extensions, and there are some 
um, ex you know, um, experiments in the paper. It's mainly a theoretical contribution, but there's some experiments that basically show in, in a variety of games, we use the gamut um, uh, platform from uh, Yoav Shoam and his, his group, which was popular back then, to, to try a variety of different matrix games and showed that um, that feel you know, for any memory bounded opponent, we're able compared to some of the you know, the natural competitors at the time, it's able to quickly find the right model and converge there when you're playing against memory bounded opponents. And that at the bottom graph is again in self play, it's able to find a Nash equilibrium. Um, again, there's some details um, in the paper, but uh, but it, the you know the main summary here is that this is a you know seamless is a, um, a is still, as far as I know, the, the only multi-agent learning algorithm that it, that achieves these three pro properties, convergence and self-play, targeted optimality against memory-bounded adversaries in the best reported time complexity, um, and, uh, and safety. And um, there, uh, we, have, we did extend it beyond that, to, that, that 2010 introduction um, which, which was what these slides were from, we did actually extend it to Markov agents in general factored MDPs. So it, it doesn't need to just be um, a matrix game. And a Markov agent is, is, you know, could actually condition on, the, um, condition on the full history as long as you have a sufficient statistic of that history. So for instance, it could play you know, defect if there's been an even number of defects in the past or, or um, or uh, cooperate if there's been an even number of cooperates in the past, or some kind of statistic over the full history that you can that that uh, that you can model in a in a uh, using a Markov state. Um, and so, uh, so there is an extension to that. It's basically doing the whole structured learning uh, structured learning problem for factored MDPs, and then we use that to um, to apply this in our Amos 2013 paper to ad hoc teamwork. And so that's why I consider this to be you know, connected to the introduction I gave at the beginning of this talk on um, on ad hoc teamwork. Um, there's also the, the these ideas of adversary the, the adversary induced Markov decision process. Um, we also used to apply to security games in some collaboration in the collaboration with Fei Feng and and um, and Milan Tambe um, and in uh, Ichikai 2015. And so, so those are some some papers I would point you to if you're interested in this line of work. Um, but mainly the the you know the, the details of what I just described. The best source is this JAMAS 2013 um, article. And and if if this if you're interested in this, I, I encourage you to um, to read that. And we'd be more than happy to hear any any feedback or comments on that. So, let me pause there. Um, I do want to. I, I guess you know there's 10 minutes left or so. So I could spend five minutes each on um, on these, you know, pay, my Ichikai, these Ichikai 2020 and Amos 2021 papers, just to give an overview. Um, but if there's questions on Seamless first, I could take them now, or I could wait. You know, you can always ask questions at the end of the talk. I think we have a couple of questions in uh, the Dory or the Q and A section, but they maybe make sense to ask it uh, more at the end. Uh, okay, it's my feeling, but okay, let's do that then. So, yeah. so I'll. Uh, and I'll go through these. These are I'm, I'm going to just give overviews. This is much more um, recent work. I just want to give you the flavor of, of some other um, studies that we're doing, motivated by ad hoc teamwork that are very relevant to multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, the first was it uh, was just recently presented last month at Ichikai 2020. Um, it's on balancing individual preferences and shared objectives in multi-agent reinforcement learning. On my website, there's a 15-minute version of this uh, that that Elad um, uh, presents. Um, it's joint work with my uh, so Elad's a former PhD student, Ishan a current PhD student um, in my lab. But the, I'll just give the 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 premise here is we're studying multi-agent reinforcement learning in collaborative tasks where each agent can have a preference for the policy that it that it um, that it executes, and so. Um, the motivation, uh, Elad is a fantastic musician, and his the, the motivation comes from, um, you know, people jamming in a in like in a jazz band where people might come with their own preferences for their styles or the kind you know what they want to do with the piece, but really they have a joint, ultimately they have a joint objective, which is playing something well for the audience that that's that's listening, and so. Um, you know, the question here is, is, you know, if we went, if we took this kind of thing to a, to a robot band um, and where they, where they're all trying to, you know, create music together, um, 
what happens if they you know they have both this shared goal and uh, and and a mix of their own sort of individual preferences in there um and so we're, we this is we you know we study this within the the multi agent reinforcement learning framework you're all familiar with the this diagram i'm sure um the idea that we look at in this paper is what if the you know each agent is getting both the environmental reward which is the true thing that you're trying to optimize um that the team is trying to optimize. So that's the true team reward, but it's blended when they're learning their, when they're deciding what actions to take, it's blended with a mix, a weighted mixing scheme, which e where each agent has its own alpha value um, with, an, with their own individual preference. Um, and then we use a, we use a, a um, we basically generate some uh, examples of their preference policy and then use Gale to generate the reward that encourages staying close to this preference, but they'll, you know, but um, but you know, optimizes this weighted combination. And um, you know, more specifically, each agent's reward function is combined with the environment reward using um, using this mixing scheme. And so this mixing scheme specifies how selfish or how or how selfless um, each of the agents are. And so the question we ask in this paper, we we have a theoretical component which asks, can an intermediate mixing scheme with preferences not perfectly aligned with the shared task lead to the optimal policy on the shared task? And the answer, um, so the, you know, the question is, obviously, if we give them all the, the, the shared task and, and, we, you know, and we have them try to optimize that, then, um, you know, then if they can find an optimal policy, it will be optimizing that. But, um, but it turns out that you know, we, can find, we can find some, some mixing schemes where, um, where it speeds up learning and yet uh, and yet doesn't compromise optimality whatsoever, um, and so uh, and that's sort of the you know that's that's the key here. Um, I'm not going to go through the analysis because of, of time. It's in the in the paper and also in the longer presentation that Alad gives on uh, that you can find on my website. Um, but uh, but then we we uh, experimented with this in a number of different domains. So we used a, a predator prey domain. We used a, a chord generation domain, which is more directly inspired from by uh, by the musical setting, and we looked at a bunch of different agents, um, you know, so different agent team combinations. So you could have you know all agents of type zero, all agents of type three, or some different mix, and then we look at the alpha values along the x-axis. So for instance, on the left side here, um, where they're all given zeros, they're purely selfish, um, and then the color scheme here, the the heat map is you know, the, the lighter it is, the better team reward they get ultimately. So if they're all purely selfish, in most cases, they don't do very well. Um, but also if they're all purely selfless, if they're all trying to optimize the, um, the team reward, they also don't end up finding um, a good policy in, um, it within the, the time limit that we give them. This is uh, you know, a 100 episode um, test. Whereas if we give them a, 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 an intermediate mixing scheme, um, in this case, one where they're all um, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.1 selfish and 0.9 selfless, um, we can get much better performance. And then similarly, in this core generation domain, there's also there's a different intermediate value, but again, neither extreme turns out to be the the best. Um, and then we also in this paper look at um, what happens if we want to to try to find. So that was under the premise that. The mixing scheme is given, um, you know, like the agents come to the table, and we're just trying to see what will happen. Um, but then you could also go ask the question: What if, as a designer, we can set how um, selfless or selfish the agents are? What should we do? And so then we also look at using a Bayesian optimization method to find this optimal mixing scheme, um, and and do that in these two different domains. And again, um, they can do much better than the purely selfish or pure purely selfless um, behaviors. Um, so that's the that's the, the the sort of five minute version of of that paper which you can find in um, at Ichkai 2020. Um, again, with a longer presentation on my on my website. Um, the and then the other the other thing I'll just uh, I'll talk about briefly um, is some multi agent reinforcement learning we've been doing for um, optimizing for reducing traffic congestion, and this is at uh, being presented at AMOS 2021, um, joint work with uh, Daniel Urielli, who, who, Daniel Urielli, who's at General Motors, um, 
as well as several students uh, here at UT Austin. And um, you may have seen these kinds of from from uh, the from Berkeley's Flow uh, group this this really nice demonstration that you know if you try if you take uh, traffic and just have it travel in a loop um, where everybody's trying to drive drive the same speed at first they're going to end up um, creating a traffic wave but if we take one car the red car and use reinforcement learning to moderate its speed it can change its speed so that all the traffic goes smoothly. So again, like if I show this video at the beginning, at the beginning of the video, there's no control. All of the cars are just trying to maintain a constant speed. But if there's any noise in that, as there are when people drive, you get this sort of you know, waves of congestion that are familiar. But if then we turn on control for the red car, um, there is a policy that will basically smooth out that congestion. And this is it's a really compelling demo. Um, but it's got some limitations. It's on this ring road with a single autonomous car. So in our AMOS paper, we look at um, scaling this up to multiple autonomous vehicles, and now it becomes a multi-agent reinforcement learning problem um, in a larger and open non-ring road kind of scenario. So, um, so we look at an open network with that's uh, that you know. So now that cars come and go, but they you know they don't just go around in a circle. Um, and we look at a merge where there can be some cars coming in from the side. Um, and we have a few RL agents that if you know that can can learn to moderate their speed to and ultimately what you'd like them to do is you know leave periodic gaps for cars to be able to come in um, from the merging lane, but not create too much congestion on the main uh, the main artery. So um, so that there's added challenges by having multiple agents. And we also look at a much more complex network that's longer in length and more vehicles. This is actually patterned off of the I-696 junction in, in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And, um, and so in our AMOS paper, again, I, if I were giving a full talk on this, I'd give all the details, but, um, but we, we use uh, a, a reward for multi-agent reinforcement learning, not based on the average speed of the cars in the network, but rather based on the outflow, um, how much basically how many cars leave the network, what's the rate of cars leaving the network, um, given a fixed traffic inflow distribution. And there's various reasons that that actually um, ends up being different than the uh, optimizing, oops, optimizing average velocity um, and, and works better as a, as a multi-agent reward signal. And then we explore both a centralized policy where we're controlling all of the autonomous cars um, in a, uh, from a centralized controller and a more distributed um, version where we're, where each car is learning by itself what to do, executing its own, own policy. Um, and and uh, this, this paper was sort of our first foray into this domain, but there's some really fascinating open questions for multi-agent reinforcement learning that, that, um, that come out of this. So if you're interested, um, I, uh, I encourage you to come and see our paper at, uh, at AMOS 2021. Um, Okay, but with that, this, the timing actually worked out just about right. I think you wanted me to stop at 10 minutes before the hour, and that's when that is, that's what it is now. So just as a summary, um, I introduced in this talk the notion of, of ad hoc teamwork, where we're trying to create um, agents that can cooperate with unknown teammates, um, previously unknown teammates in, a, in sort of quick time um, as a general problem for uh, multi-agent systems, and uh, and then um, where many of the sub-problems do admit for reinforcement learning or multi-agent reinforcement learning approaches. Um, the uh, and then the the work that I decided to focus on for this talk, especially, was this this uh, the work from Doran Ch Chakraborty from about ten years ago on the, introducing the seamless algorithm um, that achieves convergence, targeted optimality, and safety in multi-agent learning. Um, and then some more recent work that I encourage you to to take a look at. So um, I guess, uh, yeah, with that, I'll be happy. Uh, I heard there are there are some questions, and so happy to stick around and, and discuss for as long as people would like. I'll clap on behalf of everybody for, for you, Peter. Uh, and then, yeah, there are some questions that are already on the, the chat. Um, so maybe we can start with some of those on the Q&A. So uh, how about Lewis Blackburn? Are you around? You want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, hi. Sorry. Um, I was just wondering. So you mentioned about the uh, process of um, trying to calculate the, um, the, the bounding state 
uh, for for that agent based on the uh, based on that process. Um, so I was wondering how that kind of compared to um, theory of mind algorithms, where uh, agents have a kind of internal representation of what they believe the other agent there's uh, policy or understanding of of the world is, so they can kind of uh, make a decision based on that. And how does that compare and contrast to uh, Seamless's approach, where it tries to iteratively work out: is this a seamless agent? No, is this a memory bound agent? No, is this an arbitrary agent? So, how, how does that compare and contrast? Yeah, I mean, I think so. The yeah, there's two different parts you could be asking about. So there's the you know the overall flowchart of the algorithm, which is this one. Um, that's not so much of a belief state. Um, uh, kind of um, elicitation. That's more of a of a testing to see what type this agent is. Is it you know, like is this a you know is this like me? Is this different? It's a um, so I, I think this would this part of it would be less related to that that other work. I think probably the most related is more this this find k algorithm, which is you know that that's more actively you know modeling and saying if it were a memory bounded agent with with model um, you know, with memory bound of two, here's what I would predict they would do. And so I'm going to, you know, um, at that stage of the algorithm, act as if that is my, you know, the the um, the type of agent I'm um, I'm operating with, and use the RMAX algorithm to, you know, to um, to find the the optimal policy against that agent. Um, but it's uh, but it's always sort of maintaining a possibility, and especially by having to you know to uh, um, periodically assume that it has a larger model and explore in uh, down that path. It's um, it's sort of maintaining a, you know a par parallel beliefs of of you know what are the possible models of the teammate, and it's and you know for each one it's saying if it were memory bounded with with model k plus one. Here's the policy I need to, to execute. If it's a you know model memory bound two, here's the policy I need to execute. And it's sort of you know it, um, continually uh, you know updating its its beliefs about what the internal state of the opponent is. So I'm not sure if that answers your that answers your question. I mean, I think it, you know it is. You can think of it as a um, you know if, if you're you know, as sort of a theory of mind kind of thing where you're you know you're trying to to figure out what is the the belief of this agent, but but we're actually putting more of a restriction on the other agent in, in that you know it's um, it, the class of of policies it could be executing is this sort of you know um, probabilistic based on a fixed history window, um, and so it's you know a little bit less open ended I think than than you know sort of the more um, some some of the different work, but I mean, like you said, I think there's a lot of different work, so it's I'd have to compare to each each of them. Um, I don't know. Does that does that answer your question? Or, or yeah, that's a uh, no. That's a uh, that's a pretty that's a pretty interesting uh, look at it. I was as, as you were talking about the fine K algorithm approach. I was kind of yeah. This this seems to tie in quite nicely to the theory of mind problems where um, yeah. you have these where you, where you uh, uh, the Facebook AI paper in particular. You know the 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 one where they solve Han where they in effect solve Hanabi. Um, uh, yeah. Through through uh, through Sparta, uh, I'm kind of looking into a lot of that stuff at the minute. So this seems like a quite uh, related yeah. domain. But yeah, that that comes you know, across. Oh, sorry, Karen. One, one thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think I, it's a good connection. But one thing that's important here that's very different from you know Hanabi or anything like this is we assume mm -hmm. full observability here. So so mm -hmm. we assume that that the I know what the past history is, and the other agent knows what the past history is. There's no uns There's no like belief state aspect of this right there's there's no like i need to try to figure out what they think the state is and they need to think what i think the state is we in all of this work we all know what the state is because it's the history of past actions and those are fully observable so i guess you know from that perspective it doesn't it doesn't uh it's orthogonal to the to the work on on theory of mind right okay cool thank you very much cool franz you want to ask your question Sure, uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, I guess we can also first take the other questions, but uh, I'm talking already. I, I, I die. Uh, so, so thanks, uh, Peter. It was a very interesting talk. Um, and so I, I, I guess I'm, uh, I understand that the, the, the seamless algorithm, uh, uh, to some extent, of course, is also like a theoretical uh, 
uh, uh, point that kind of shows that you can get these properties. I was wondering in practice, um, you know, if we uh, have a game, a general sum game, there could be a large number of, of, of Nash equilibria uh, or uh, potentially even continuum of these Nash equilibria. Um, and so then this kind of like trying to coordinate on one specific Nash equilibrium, you know, might, uh, yeah, might be, might really fail in practice, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, so do you I have think any that, ideas? Yeah. So, so I think the, the, and, and this you know, related to the question that was brought up earlier, I mean, so we could have just said for any given game, uh, seamless agents have a, you know, sort of, um, Total order preference over Nash equilibria, and they'll just all play the pre, the you know their um, you know the the uh, the favorite one in some sense. Um, the uh, you know if we give identities to the agents, so like you know you're agent one, I'm agent two, and then you know we have some way of of, of having a you know a shared database of our ordering over over um, Nash equilibria, then then you you can just solve that. I think Doran when he did this wanted to to really keep it you know, as, as general as possible in terms of the, um, the knowledge that the agents have about each other and the, and the game so that you'd have to randomly search through the, you know, the Nash equilibria to find one that you match up at. And um, so, you know, but I think given, given that we're already assuming that we're all seamless agents, I think, you know, you could, you could, you know, if we gave a correlation signal like phase of the moon or, or anything like that, as a way of breaking symmetry over the Nash equilibria, you know, we could build that into the agents fairly easily. And I think that would be the practical thing if you're trying to, to really work in games where there's you know, con a continuum of equilibria. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I guess, Steven, you're next. Do you wanna ask your question? Sure. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, so, what if we assume that agents could sign binding contracts before play that say, uh, I move, you know, I take this action and you take that action. And if both agents agree to it, then both of them have to take that action. It seems like that could help a lot for uh, sort of ad hoc teamwork. Um, but, you know, for prisoner's dilemma or something, both agents could say, yeah, sure, I'll cooperate if you cooperate. Um, but on the other hand, it might just turn into another larger general sum game uh, in the negotiation phase of this contract. So um, have you thought about this? Yeah, so I mean, once you put in sort of a negotiation protocol, you have to have pretty strong assumptions that the agents are all um, privy to that protocol. And so in ad hoc teamwork, we try to, we, we, we try to, to avoid assumptions of that kind. So, um, uh, but you know, I, I guess you know, in the full generality, what an what an ad hoc team agent should do is, you know, if there is a solution of that kind, um, that if the other agents are privy to it, will work best for all of us. The first thing it should do is, you know, is probe, um, you know, it, to, to the other agents. You know, is this something you know? So, like for instance, when I go play in a pickup soccer game with people I've never seen before, the first thing I do is I talk to them in English and say, you know, uh, what position do you play? But if they look at me and they're confused, then I say, okay, we probably don't speak the same language. Let's try to coordinate in some other way. So I think, you know, th this would be that same sort of thing is, is, you know, if there's, I might send my action to some binding, you know, arbitration place where, you know, where I'm committed to it. But if I find that the other agents don't do that, then pretty quickly, I'm going to have to fall back to some other coordination mechanism. Um, the one thing we do do in, in ad hoc teamwork is we assume Typically, we assume that the agents are teammates, so they're not out to get us. We don't have to protect against the worst case in um, in ad hoc teamwork in general. We we you know we're usually trying to optimize the average case, um, but they might not be good at doing the you know the um, they might not be good at being teammates. So we have to more sort of protect against um, you know in, inadvertent or unintentional incompetency. But we generally don't have to sort of, you know, guard against the worst case because we're assuming that this is a teamwork setting. So, okay, I, maybe maybe that's not a full answer to your your, your question. I think, but I, I think that the you're right that having these sort of binding actions 
uh, you know, that can help in multi-agent systems in general, but it's, it's not, I, yeah, I think it's not something we've looked at in the ad hoc teamwork context because it sort of requires some fair, some strong assumptions that we don't usually make in the ad hoc teamwork. Yeah, thank you. And there's a, there's a hand raised. Uh, Cesar, do you want to ask your question? Yes, hi, thank you. Thank you for the talk. I had a question on the second uh, group of research that you were talking about, the, the balancing individual preferences. And mm -hmm. it seemed you had a chance to explore what the effect of setting sort of a, a population of, uh, of agents that had actually different propensities towards selfishness or selflessness. And I was wondering yeah. what your thoughts were on sort of the importance of these values in relation to each other. Uh, yeah. So actually, interestingly enough, in this core generation domain, we found that the best um, one of the best uh, mixes was where three agents were being selfless and one was having a, you know, a, a sort of a blend between selfish and selfless of, um, of 0.5. And, and uh, I have, you know, in, in multi-agent learning in general, um, you know, it, it can, you know, having just one that's, you know, that's trying to draw the others towards this, you know, the focal point can, um, can help a lot. So, you know, if they're all selfless, then you do get this problem of, of like finding the right, you know, finding one of many possible Nash equilibria. Whereas if one of them is is uh, being a little bit selfish, that can be the thing that that sort of quickly draws you towards the Nash equilibrium that that agent prefers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in the paper we do have some experiments comparing to, you know, what if we have three agents learning and one agent fixed, or two agents learning and two agents fixed, or or all, you know, or all of the agents learning. Um, we do find that that. Uh, you know, there's sort of separate effects there that 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 we we get better performance using these sort of um, intermediate mixing schemes than we can by just having uh, you know than than having just fixed agents. And so, um, but it's I think there's still this that was all empirical. We don't have anything. Yeah, you know, I don't think there's there's not. Um, you know, I think there's some some interesting op questions that this that this paper opens up. Um, that uh, you know that that could could be pursued further, but but yes, I think the we we definitely do have at least evidence in some of these domains that um, that you know not having all of the agents having the same propensity for selfishness um, can actually be be beneficial. So then, related to that, I guess I have a follow up question because uh, mm -hmm. it seems like depending on exactly what the if you're trying to just learn a cooperative problem more efficiently, then it's uh, a, more of a uh, a credit assignment problem, right? Like, like there's a bunch of work on how do you break up a global reward into local rewards to try and learn more efficiently? And then it seems like maybe that's more similar, but that is getting away from preferences, right? That's just, I want to try and solve a cooperative problem, but right. it, you know, just giving the global reward is, is inefficient for doing that. But right. uh, so it seems like that's related to what maybe what you're trying to do here, but depending on what the setting is. Right. So this is not like uh, in, in in the paper we give you know relate this to like you know things like uh, that that Shimon Whiteson's group has been doing on QMix and and um, and Coma and things like that. Um, the difference here is we're not assuming any you know we're, we're taking more of the ad hoc teamwork assumption where we're not assuming any centralized training. So it's you know rather than centralized training and decentralized execution, this is um, decentralized training and decentralized execution. They're they're, they're just uh, you know th there's no there's no single policy telling them all what to do. It's just, it's fully distributed from start to finish. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, I'll have to check it out in more detail. Uh, I think there was one more question, if you have time, Peter, for Lewis yeah. again. Yeah, I, sure. Uh, yeah, mine's on a kind of similar note. Um, so uh, with, the, with the issue of uh, selfishness versus so I can't talk today. Selfishness versus selflessness. Um, is a are there any kind of mech, are there any kind of mechanism designs for kind of uh, selflessness within kind of subpopulations of the whole population? So if say an agent could have some kind of recognition of oh well uh, this agent has a similar kind of objective to my own agent, therefore I'm going to try to make actions that benefit us both more than the population as a whole. Is there some kind of like sub? Is there some kind of Sub selflessness slash selfishness, I guess, some kind of combination like that, or is or is that not something that's been explored? 
Uh, I haven't explored that. I mean, this sort of optimizing mixing schemes is sort of, you know, in that direction, except that you know, I think you're going a step further, which is, I think, a really interesting you know, question is what if you, you know, in addition, give a propensity for cooperating with, with other agents that are like you somehow, like, you know, there's this no notion of us and them, which is, you know, common in, in nature. Um, and I think that would be fascinating to explore. We haven't, uh, but yeah, I, I haven't done that in this in this setting. So it's a good, it's a great, great point, and uh, be be really interesting to see what what uh, you know how how we could um, augment this in that direction. So yeah, uh, thank you, left. thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any last questions? I don't. I think we did. We get to all the ones that are listed now. If anybody has any, oh, there's one more. I think. I can I have one more? I just uh, so I assume that the camera K memory boundedness is a way to measure how smart the other agents are. But uh, maybe in reality, this might not be like a practical way of measuring it. Like if you are facing humans or robots that somebody else programmed. So are there some um, follow-ups that would consider other versions, or, or do you think that the yeah. mark of agents assumption is sufficient? Yeah, so I, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily say it's how smart they are. Um, I mean, you know, you could argue that a, that a tit for tat agent in in Prisoner's Dilemma, which has a memory bound of one, is as smart as you need to be in that setting, and that having a you know a larger memory wouldn't necessarily make you, you know, make you smarter. Um, right. It's more of a a measure of of just you know what is the you know, what, what's their policy or what's their, what's their representation, their internal representation. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the extension that, that I think generalized that generalizes this um, in what I think is, is, you know, a, a pretty powerful next step is, is this sort of idea of Markov, um, Markov agents. So, so for instance, the, in a limitation in the K, in this K step is that if we, you know, if, if the agent has a, um, uh, um, only decides what to do based on the action I took five steps ago. Then we say it has a memory bound of five, and we have to model the full combinatorial, you know, uh, memory, you, you know, things that it would do based on what I did one step ago, two step ago, three, four, and five. Even though I'm only conditioning on the 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 action, you know, it's only conditioning on the action I took five steps ago. The generalization to uh, to um, to Markov agents allows it to represent the other opponent as um, you know just basing its policy on the action I took five steps ago and 10 steps ago and, and completely ignoring the ones in, in, in between or any other factors. So it's, it's much more of a general um, factored MVP kind of setting and it can ignore uh, it can ignore any of them. And you know, so, so we're in the way I presented it, it sort of is making this assumption that if you, know, you, you have to take the highest value and that, that could, lead to unnecessarily unnecessary representational explosion. So, um, so I do think, yeah, if you want to, if you want to make this more powerful um, and, and, rep and, and cover a, a more interesting class of teammates um, or adversaries in a way that, that is, uh, that remains as efficient, then, um, then you do have to go to the extensions that we did in, in 2011, in the ICML 2011 paper. Um, and then showed that how that could be applied in, in the 2013 paper. And I should, you know, also, you know, following up on Fra uh, Franz's question as well, um, that, you know, we, in, in some of these papers, especially this Amos 2013 one, we did do more empirical um, experiments of these kinds of algorithms. And then, you know, we don't use the, we don't use the values that the theory tells us to, because, you know, as in most theory, then, then it would be requiring us to do millions of iterations just to, you know, for the sake of keeping it polynomial, um, but we do find that if we, you know, if we if we use sort of smaller practical values of all of those of many of our parameters, um, we're able to get good performance in in practice. And so, you know, the the theory here, you know, the the theory is to make the proofs go through. Um, but we actually did find that we could use these algorithms, you know, in in practical settings. We looked at at um, at sort of a, a ticket checking domain. Um, where you know, where where you're like a where a train conductor is deciding when to um, when to you know check a ticket a passenger's ticket in a uh, in a particular uh, case, or we looked at some a domain where um, was more of a uh, 
a surveillance kind of domain where there's an adversary trying to decide when to get try to to um, penetrate a uh, the boundary where some robots are are doing surveillance and and these could all be represented using this kind of um, these kinds of this kind of formalism and we found that we could get practical um, practical results using the sort of framework of seamless um, even if we didn't use the you know the parameters that the theory would require us to. Thanks. I'll check the paper in for the details. Okay. Saw another right, chat well, come up there. Oh, is there another question or is that? Uh, yes, I guess there is. So we'll take that one last question, I guess, and then we can we can end. Uh, so go ahead, ask your question if you're still around. Just saw it pop up, but I wasn't able to read it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I, 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 no, no, I, I think I was just commenting, so it was not really a question. Sorry. Okay. What well, What's the comment? Just out of curiosity. So, 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 okay. It was just a comment about the previous question that, like, I suppose one can like look at the K memory bound as a uh, bounded rationality in the sense of like computation rationality. For both humans and agents, you're just saying yeah. that this agent yeah. has some computational or cognitive bounds, and you know it can only compute or store this much. Yes, I agree. That's that's a that's a, yeah that's a good way of thinking of the memory bound. All right. So thank you very much again, Peter. Very cool work. I know I'm at least going to check out all these papers in more detail, and I'm sure lots of other people will as well. It was a great talk. It was great to have you. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation. And yeah, if there's any follow-up questions about any of this, feel free to reach out. Anyone's you know, more than welcome to, to reach out by email. It's easy to find my email address. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Peter. Thanks a lot, Peter.